Hope you're having a great Monday night. Beautiful couple of days here in the Chicago area as July approaches. Can't believe it. Hard to believe how fast the calendar's flipping. And we're talking Bears tonight on Bears All Access here on Chicago Sports Radio 670. The score with my buddy from Sirius XM, NFL Radio's Moving the Chains, the former Bears quarterback, Mr. Jim Miller. He's down in Mobile, Alabama. Tell us what you're doing down there. And you're, we're pinch hitting because no Tom Thayer tonight. He's on vacay. How about that? Yeah. Well, hey, Tom, well earned on his parts from a little vacation. But, no, I'm down here at the Reese's Senior Bowl, their Hall of Fame induction. Uh, so it was really a special night last night. Guys like Philip Rivers, Von Miller, tremendous linebacker, obviously two-time uh, world champion. Other guys like Kevin Falk, who I played with in the, with the New England Patriots. So tremendous player who's a running back from LSU. So they all got inducted last night. And how about the Rookie of the Year, Creed Humphrey, mm-hmm. who's the starting center for the Kansas City Chiefs. He got inducted for the Rookie of the Year, was a tremendous player. Left-handed center. He's the only left-handed center I've ever seen. Can snap the ball, and he snaps it every time clean uh, to Patrick Mahomes. So so truly a great night. They're out golfing right now, uh, today. And so a nice round of golf, and it's a beautiful day here in Mobile. All right. Did you get a chance to talk to Humphrey, by the way? Yes, I did. Any Got any thing, any insights? Any insights on maybe the Ryan Poles connection? Well, no, I think for, for him, one, him and Trey Smith, imagine him. Both those guys got drafted last year by the Kansas City Chiefs made every single regular season game, both played all the way through the the playoffs, didn't miss a snap. So think about that, the impact of young draft picks and how they can instantly come in and impact your team. So two two out of five guys of their offensive line never miss a snap as rookies. So, yeah, it's important. Drafting doesn't matter what round you go in, whether it's the first through the last round, the seventh round. These guys were impact impactful players for the Kansas City Chiefs. Coming up at the bottom of the hour, uh, Tom and I did catch up last week with second-year cornerback Thomas Graham. Uh, you'll enjoy that interview. He's uh, got great character, and he's very excited about his role, Jimmy. Uh, you are not involved in that interview, but... Uh, when we hear it later on, you're going to hear a confident guy, and uh, he has a great opportunity here. Maybe, maybe, maybe one of the underrated stories, possibly, of training camp will be Thomas Graham. Well, he's got an opportunity. I think he's going to have an opportunity to, to carve out a nickel slot role. You know, you think about him late in the year for the Bears. He got some. You know, to me, it's invaluable when you get in there. Every snap, you, every snap that you get is valuable. And I thought he had impactful snaps uh, for the Bears last year. Now you've got a new coaching staff evaluating him. He's from the old regime, and already, obviously, he's made a good first impression and going to have an opportunity this fall in camp for the Bears. And he'll tell you that it, this defense is more reflective of what he played in his junior year at Oregon, and so. He, he loves the idea of 11 guys going after the football. Yeah, well, I mean, that's the key. I mean, uh, Coach uh, Matt Eberflus has, has really preached that, that that's the standard. Guys got to be able to run. Uh, they've got to fly to the football. And, you know, when good good things happen, when you do that, you know, the ball, you never know when the play's over. Could it be a forced fumble? You know, if you're just flying to the ball, almost like a swarm of bees, you got to be almost like a, a killer bee mentality. And it sounds like that that's what they're trying to generate uh, for the Bears this fall. Now, the old Dolphins had some killer bees, right? Not, but, no. hey, you know, maybe you just – we got the new version of the Killer Bees, hopefully. Right? I told you, hey, I started coaching flag football with my son, Manny, and I had all the kids buzzing like bees for that very reason. I go, hey, what do bees do? They go towards the honey, right? <laughs> bees go to So they all, before the snap of the ball, bzzz, you hear them all just buzzing. All and then right. once that ball snap, you got to be a Killer Bee and fly to the honey. Now, I like it. I like it. We had barking back in the Otis Wilson days. Now we're buzzing for the Bears of 2022. Jim, you're onto something here. See, you're an idea man, just like there. Got to keep it simple, right? And the kids, they loved it. They followed it, and they did. They always got the honey, and good things were going to happen. All right, a uh, little honey for Cotter Gordon in terms of his first pro contract. That happened over the weekend. Uh, the second-round pick signed his four-year contract. You know, you don't realize these things until you, you think about them more in context for what's ahead. You know, on draft day, we all have notes on players, but, you know, it occurred to me that, Last year was the first time he was a full-time starter, and now he's an expected 16-game starter in the National Football League as a rookie. He's got to earn that job, but, you know, everybody's kind of penciled him in at the other cornerback spot opposite Jalen Johnson. There will be competition, however, and he's going to have to earn it, but that's a big ask for for a guy, isn't it? 
Yeah, I mean, certainly for him, you know, obviously expectations are going to be there. He's going to make his share of mistakes. This is a big corner now. He's six foot, 200 pounds. So the physicality's there. Now he's got to learn the nuances of the position. He's going to have to grow from the mental side of the game. Again, he's going to make his share of mistakes. And as a player, you can't get intimidated uh, by that. You got to have that short term mentality where you just shelve that play, put it behind you, and go on to the next. So every rep in practice, uh, in training camp, is going to be important for him. The walkthroughs are going to be important. It's learning, learning, learning. It's going to come at him fast, all right? But, you know, for him, he's got to be able to have thick skin, put it behind him, and move forward. It's always about the next play, and I'm excited for him. This is a talented young player that is going to have an opportunity uh, for the Chicago Bears, and we'll see how he stacks up. But physically, he can stack up against the best. It's yeah. how quickly he learns the mental part of the game. The other stuff I love about him, the intangibles, of course, he, he is a competitor. He competes, he's tough, and he's very smart. Okay, so Jaquan Brisker, the only unsigned rookie in that 12-man class, that'll get taken care of. And I was just going through what was written uh, today, this morning, about the Bears from over the weekend because, it, you know, even though it's – this dead period, there's always column inches being written. And so there was a lot about uh, Jaquan Brisker from uh, our own Larry Mayer from ChicagoBears.com. Uh, Patrick Finley did a whole piece on Matt Eberflus's desire to limit penalties. And that was a topic at the end of the re- veteran minicamp. Two of the last three seasons, the Colts were the least penalized defense in the NFL. And interesting to note, though, Jim, that these two rookies were just talking about Brisker and Gordon they did not have a single penalty in their final two years in college. So will that well, transition well? Yeah, that well, one, it talks about their discipline, right? And Coach is right. I mean, people forget about the penalties because that's what we call hidden yardage, right? I mean, anytime, say, when a, a kickoff return, say, is to the 20-yard line or the 25-yard line, anytime you get a, a yard further, say, if it's the 26, 27, 28-yard line, all the way up to 30, yes. 1% every time a uh, yard – it leads to points. That percentage always increases. And so if you don't give up the hidden yardage, you get better opportunities where you can lower that percentage. I mean, it's just cheap yardage that you're you're giving an offense and it gives them more of a percentage to, to score. So I think it tells about how disciplined these players are and what they were in college. And yeah, I do think it'll translate to the NFL because they've already trained themselves not to do those such foolish things. Yeah, you think about the, the corners, the safeties on a deep play. Maybe it's third and 16 and Aaron Rodgers is just throwing it up there to see what he can get yeah. and you get that first down off a third and long and that those are the ones that rip your heart out or on the offensive side of the ball the potential here for two young tackles maybe even a rookie tackle those guys get their share of holding penalties well you bring up a good point I mean think about that I I mean I thought the NFL was going to address the the pass interference rule because you're right that becomes a spot foul you know is what it is I wish it was just a 15 yard penalty which is still a killer yeah it's It's a killer killer, but but I hate it I hate it the other way I mean imagine me as a quarterback you brought up Aaron Rodgers if I'm at the 50 yard line and I throw it up to the one yard line that ball if it's a pass interference call it goes to the one yard line it's a spot foul it's devastating to what it can do not only for your football team but the psyche of your team all right, we got a bunch of stats to throw at you coming up in our next segment here about Justin Fields from other analysts out there that do all the analyticals and throw some interesting comments in there about what's next for Justin Fields and the Bears. With Jim Miller, I'm Jeff Joniak. This is Bears All Access here on Chicago Sports Radio 670 The Score. Welcome back to Bears All Access, brought to you by IGS Energy. Choose clean energy for your home at IGS.com because every good choice adds up to a better world. Former Bears quarterback Jim Miller from Sirius XM NFL Radio is moving the chains with us from Mobile, Alabama. Uh, Who else did you rub shoulders with over the weekend? I had a great conversation with Brett Favre this morning. He looks in great shape. He's into triathlons now. He's into biking and, and all that stuff. But he brought up great things about, you know, when he played and how to play through things. And, you know, just his sheer toughness. Obviously, we know the the toughness of Brett Favre. The guy started consecutive over 200 games. And I talked to Phillip Rivers as well. Think about Phillip Rivers. Started 240 consecutive games in the NFL. Just that availability that they're always there for their teammates. They, they just want, you know, their fellow teammates, their coaches – to know that, hey, I'm going to be the guy. I will be here every single Sunday. And I think that's something that Justin Fields, he's going to have to prove that, right? He got a little beat up last year, took some big shots. 
He's got to be smarter in how he approaches the game because he's got to be there every single week for, for his teammates and hopefully for all Bears fans that he's able to line up, say, over 200 consecutive games. All right, I saw this on uh, sports social media, uh, uh, something called SIS Football. They did some analytics on Justin Fields. Uh, when he was contacted behind the line of scrimmage, he got a first down 29.4% of the time. That's first in the NFL. And then his stuff percentage was 35.3. That was second lowest in the NFL. So the idea here is, Jim, which we certainly know from that 49ers game on that memorable play, that's a glimpse of the future, being able to create something out of nothing. And and that will be one of the intangible elements that will continue to shine as he gets more and more comfortable back there, won't it? I mean, these, these stats are interesting, uh, given his, frankly, small amount of playing time, 10 right. games or so last season. Yeah, I think his his imp- improbability is special. You know, it's something that you can't coach, uh, whether it's, you know, the the coaches Luke Getze or, or Matt Eberflus. You don't want to coach that out of him. That's what makes Justin Fields so special. But at the same point, what you can coach in him is the risk-reward. Know when to go down. It's okay sometimes to take a sack. You can't make a play – every single play, uh, you know, because it, it could be a negative play, whether you, you know, because he's so strong physically, it could lead to a fumble or, or things like that. So there are times where he's going to have to know, hey, I just need to get down here. You know, the, the taking the sack is the best play. It's the only play. Or if he decides to take off and scramble and utilize his skill sets, which are so special, when to get down, when to get out of bounds. You know, there are certain situations where he's going to have to give up his body. Maybe it's a third and one where he scrambles and has to lower his shoulder and, and get a first down. So the risk rewards are what he's going to have to weigh and how the coaching is, you know, that they're communicating to him or when those situations are. And he will. He's, he's too smart of a player. He's too special of a player. And he's got all the speed. He's got all the toughness. We know that uh, about him. And I think he'll just continue to learn and get better. So last year, he ran the ball 72 times, whether these are scrambles or design plays. 420 yards, 5-8-3 a carry, and a couple of touchdowns. What do you envision in this style of offense with Luke Getze for Justin Fields in terms of maybe design runs? We know what he can do on the scramble, but do you see less of that, more of that, or about the same? No, I think you're going to see more of it. It'll be more incorporated than what it was a year ago. I think you'll see an RPO influence that he'll be able to attack the the line of scrimmage with his legs. I do think you're going to see a lot of the bootleg game. Because they're focused on that outside zone run, the bootleg is really just a natural play action that comes off of that. And you can do half rolls and things like that that'll set up the, the play action passes with the bootlegs, whether it's waggle routes and things like that, or even dash plays out of out of the shotgun, I think they'll all be incorporated, and they need to be, you know, consistent throughout an entire game. No matter what the score is, I think the Bears have to be consistent with their play calling to let that to let the opponents know that that's going to be a threat throughout an entire game. He's a weapon that they need to utilize. All right, you had a long career in the NFL. Uh, what challenges await a second-year quarterback? We always know what challenges await a rookie quarterback, and certainly one that did play now, and he knows what the feel and the speed of the game is. Granted, new offense, seemingly more comfortable in it. What challenges await Justin Fields? For, for me, my second year was getting to know defenses a lot more. You know, really your rookie year, you're, you're kind of focused on your offensive side of the ball. And here Justin's learning a new offense, and it'll have changes uh, to this offense. But there'll be things that carry over. But now it's about learning the defensive side of the ball. Cover three, what's a cover two? What's single high safety? What's a, a man-to-man? What's blitz zero? All these things that he's going to have to learn it. You know, if you learn it, now you know where the weaknesses are and you can start to attack those weaknesses on the defensive side of the ball. So knowing his offense like the back of his hand, now he'll be able to get in and out of things that maybe he can check to, understanding what defenses are doing and how to attack them. Then kind of year three is where it all comes together. You know the offensive side of the ball, you know the defensive side of the ball. In year three, that's where you should kind of be coming into your own as as a quarterback where 
you really know the game very well and how to attack it. So I expect big things uh, from Justin Fields. But I, it's really on the defensive side of the ball. He needs to know what they're doing in order to take advantage of it. I know he's a worker. I mean, there's videos already this morning about him in the weight room working out. Uh, somebody took videos of him working out here in this downtime, which is important for everybody. Stay, stay ready. Uh, but – I think the conquered part, the intangible part of understanding what it takes to be a pro at this level, you, you, there's no way he didn't get to know that last season. So that part of it, okay, that's already, to me, you know, taillights. Like, okay, we're moving right. forward, right? Yeah. Well, yeah, I think any player, you've got to get in a routine. You know, and, and for me, the, the routine was, you know, you shelf, say you play on Sunday, you've got to shelve that put it behind you. It's on to the next week. It's on to the next rep. It's on to the next game. You've got to stay in the now. And every day when you show up at Hallis Hall, you've got to attack that day. Every meeting's important. Uh, You know, getting all the the things that the coaches want to accomplish in terms of the game plan. And you're kind of got to compartmentalize everything, but it's getting in that routine of how you study, how you prepare, because again, preparation is everything. And I think he's, he prepared himself well in college, now it's getting the preparation for the pros week in and week out. That's really a big part of what a quarterback needs to do. Bears running game and Cole Komet, our next topic when we return. With Jim Miller, I'm Jeff Joniak. Thanks to our producers, Jordan Treadup, Dan Brilli, and the folks here at The Score for producing tonight. Stick around. More ahead here on Bears All Access, brought to you by IGS Energy on Chicago Sports Radio 670, The Score. This segment of Bears All Access is brought to you by Athletico Physical Therapy. Visit athletico.com to request an appointment in clinic or virtually and start feeling better tomorrow. Former Bears quarterback Jim Miller, our guest here on uh, Chicago Sports Radio 670, The Score from Sirius XM NFL Radio's Moving the Chains down in Mobile, Alabama, rubbing elbows with, uh, heck, former teammates, Hall of Famers, future stars. How many people there today for this uh, charity oh, there's- event? There's a ton. Think about former NFL linebacker Robert Brazil. Robert Ozzie Brazil. Here. Yeah, Robert awesome Brazil was player. a great linebacker. Ozzie Newsom's here. Obviously, he's a Hall of Fame tight end. He's a Hall of Fame GM. He's a little bit of like uh, Charlie Chaplin on radio, though. Silence <laughs> is golden with him. Uh, but Ozzie's always a, a great guy to talk to. So you led led me in right into the topic of, of tight ends. A tight end you wrapping up over the weekend, I guess. Uh, and they had a good time with it. But uh, Scott Pioli a former NFL executive, and now does a tremendous job uh, with his analysis work. This was a comment he said about Cole Komet. This guy has all the tools and is a complete tight end. He's one of the top young talents at the position in the league. High praise, obviously, so there are expectations, and we've talked a lot about Cole Komet being an integral part of this growth process with a young quarterback. What would, in your opinion, a breakout year from Cole Komet mean for the Bears right now? I think it'll be huge. Again, I, I go back to the outside zone run play, you know, because that's the foundation of the Bears and what they're trying to do. He's going to be key on the edge. You know, we talked about it last week, depending on the techniques of the end man on the line of scrimmage, at times he's going to have to uh, skate that guy out and put him on roller skates. At times he's going to have to hook him, and he's 260 pounds. I mean, let's let's be honest with Cole Komet, but he can move. So that bootleg game for him on over routes or shallow crosses, and you think of guys like George Kittle that play in this exact offense out there for the 49ers, it's going to be an impactful position. Uh, for the Bears. So I expect him to be heavily involved in the run game in terms of the point of attack at the line of scrimmage and blocking, but I expect him to be a big part of the Bears' play-action game. The ball is going to be force-fed to Cole Komet. He's going to get a lot of opportunities, and he's too athletic not to make plays. He's got nice soft hands. He can run after the catch, and he's a load to bring down. I mean, this guy truly can be a special player. And I think the Bears and Luke Getze are going to try to attack that and really force feed him the football. All right, Luke Getze in Green Bay uh, with the Green Bay Packers, bringing some of that and his own touch on this offense. And Tom wanted us to talk about this. He wanted me to look at what they did on the ground last year and what the Bears potentially could do and what you'd be happy with. So went through the the statistics uh, with a fine-tooth comb. So Packers averaged 26.2 rushing attempts a game last season. Now, obviously, this is a little bit apples and oranges because they got Aaron Rodgers. They, they could do whatever up there. And 111 yards on the ground, 4.3 carry. Bears ran it more, uh, 27.9 a game. That's 11th most. And the other big running teams 
that relate to this offense. San Francisco ran it 499 times, so the Bears are in that ballpark. Green Bay, 446, as I said. Philly, it's not the same system, but 159.7 rushing yards per game. That was number one in the league, 32 carries a game with a running quarterback. Indy, Baltimore, Cleveland, Tennessee, all 140-plus yards per game. Bears had 118.7, Green Bay 111.8. Okay, before I go any further, what would be the wheelhouse, and if you know you're winning with this running game in terms of attempts per game, and average yards per carry, what would be a wheelhouse hope for the Bears in 2022? Yeah, I like that number, about 28 carries a game. Because, you know, again, normally in a game, you're going to get about roughly 60 to 65 offensive snaps. All right, so that tells you it's balanced. If you're getting, say, 28 to 30 rushing attempts, then you factor in the the play action, which will be another 15 to 20 play actions, and then you're going to have your your other 15 to 20, which are going to be the the just straight dropbacks situation. So the key, what you brought up about, say, if you're comparing them to to Green Bay, Green Bay has Mercedes Lewis, right? He's their big, burly, blocking uh, tight end. They lost Robert Tanyan last year, who if you go back the year prior to him tearing his ACL, the guy had close to double-digit touchdowns. I think he had 11 uh, when you look at Robert Tanyan. Robert Tanyan's more the more the inline plus he can run routes. Cole Komet's all that in one. He's Mercedes Lewis and Robert Tanyan together. So he's probably legitimately, he shouldn't come off the field. He's an every down tight end that you can split out. You can put outside the numbers. You can put him in the flex position or you can put him in line for the Bears to run their play action in the bootleg game uh, that I mentioned. So legitimately, I think you're onto it, uh, Jeff. 28 to 30 rushes a game, and then the about 15 plays should be play action. Then you're probably going to have another 15 to 20 in straight dropbacks. That should be the formula for the Bears. But that support in running the football needs to be there for Justin Fields to take advantage of all those things that we just talked about. His ability to move the play action game, the bootleg game, the rollout game, all those things will be incorporated, but it's going to stem from those rushing attempts. Even though the offense struggled to score points, they did run the ball well as compared to the rest of the league. And again, you know, compare the Packers. So the Bears last year tied for 12th, 54 runs of 10 plus. Justin had something to do with that too. Green Bay had only 36 and no touchdowns. Bears had 13 20 plus yard runs, a couple of touchdowns, tied for seventh in the league. Green Bay had seven. Um, So that speaks well, obviously, to David Montgomery and Kelly Herbert. So, where are you at on those two guys as compared to that duo in Green Bay, Aaron Jones and A.J. Dillon? Yeah, I, I've said this. I do think Montgomery is the tougher runner, meaning between the tackles. So if they do the inside zone stuff or say they're going to do some power football with the power plays or say duo action, I think David Montgomery is the guy that can get the tough yardage. He's the A.J. Dillon so to speak. And then Cleo Herbert is a change of pace. He's got probably a quicker step for the outside zone game, much like, say, Aaron Jones. Not that he can't do the cutback game, because that'll be there too, because he's able to to jet and has that other gear to really hit it when the Bears want to hit it. But that, that to me, is, is how it sets up. Montgomery's the A.J. Dillon, and you look at Cleo Herbert, to me, he's the Aaron Jones in this offense for the Chicago Bears. And if you're into it, you know, 100-yard backs or quarterbacks, they usually usually result in wins if things are going well for your team. Colts were nine and one last year with that. San Francisco five and one, Cleveland five and two. So those are some teams that really run the football, and we get the idea the Bears are gonna run the football. More with Jim Miller after a interview with Tom Thayer and I and Thomas Graham, the Bears second year cornerback. It's all ahead here on Chicago Sports Radio 670 the score. This segment of Bears All Access is brought to you by CDW. People to get it with Tom Thayer, Jeff Joniak, Jim Miller along, as well as we are joined by Thomas Graham, the young corner for the Chicago Bears. Good to talk to you again. Thanks for taking the time off during your time off. And uh, I simply got to say, how excited are you right now about uh, the potential for 2022 and you being heavily involved in it? Um, I'm very excited just because, like, you know, playing football is just kind of just something that we all just want to do and just like this out there and just like now just kind of feel like right now I'm just going out there and like being able to enjoy it way more. Uh, 
than I felt like I did last year, kind of was more focused on the business side instead of playing. And now it's just kind of just like being able to just go out there and play. Just It, it makes you play and feel different. It's interesting you refer to it as the business side. Why do you say the business side? Because, you know, frankly, you had to be climbing the walls, staying on the practice squad, just biding your time. But what was the business element of it? Um, Just understanding that, like, you know, like, uh, there's a reality check. Um, and, and, like, that's the business side. There's so many people that are can only be on the team. There's so many people that can be dressed up. So it's just like I wasn't a, a starter. So since I wasn't a starter and I wasn't a main contributor on special teams last year, like, you know, it, it didn't put my, my value as high. So it's just like this year, it's just like contributing as much as I can on special teams, doing what I can defensively. It's just like kind of just like, Telling them, like, going from a, a position, like, in college where you didn't play as much special teams to where it's just, like, you got to change your mindset and, and and understand your value to the team and give it as best as you can, anything you do. Hey, Thomas, even though there's a new head coach, a new GM, did you feel different, maybe more confident when you walked on the field during this session of OTAs and mandatory minicamp than you did a year ago? Yeah, because I feel like last year I was just really focused on, like, like learning the playbook, like this and that. And it's just like this year, even though it's a new scheme, it's just like, yeah, I'm learning it, but it's just like I was trying to do everything in chunks. So it's just like when when you do everything smaller and progressively, it just kind of just like it's a, it's a different mindset you come in with. So like I was coming in with just attacking and, and learning like little step by step instead of trying to learn everything at once because, you know, we all going to make a mistake if I'm a rookie or a vet. So it's just like you go in there knowing that, it's just like your mindset is different. It's just you don't repeat that same mistake. That's how you become a vet or you stay a rookie. You know, I, I got to say, being around the Bears for 35 years now, I've never seen a defense approach the offseason with the speed in which you guys were playing. And is is that transferable from out of pads to in pads? Yes, because it just like it, it helps certain things. Like it's the little things that it helps like it teaches everybody to pursue to the ball. So, like, that one play, like, it's a tip in the air. But then it's just, like, it's a difference between you being that one step away and then you already being there because it's just, like, a habit that you already created or, you feel me, you're running to the ball the way you're doing it, doing everything full speed. Like, it's able to where, like, now you feel more comfortable with the knockback when you when you make tackles. So it's just, like, certain little things that, like, not all fans, not, like, everybody that doesn't really truly know football can see is, like, what makes that so important. Thomas Graham, Jr., our guest here on Bears All Access on Chicago Sports Radio 670 The Score with Tom Thayer, Jeff Joniak. D- does this new defensive style suit your personality better than the old style, and did you practice and play like this in college? Uh, I say this reminds me more of the defense that I had my junior year of college. Um, okay. So it's, 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 uh, I feel like it's broken down in a more simpler, um, complex way uh easier to learn um I feel like really you can only run like six or seven coverages it's kind of just like really what the coach uh likes to run more of so it's just like I feel like certain little things are different but as a whole um I think I can play a, way, a whole lot faster mainly just from just being in the having the year of experience under my my belt you got to feel fresh too because let's be honest you know you did not play in 2020 due to the pandemic at Oregon and then you don't get to play until what week fifteen against yes. Minnesota, and so and you played every snap, so <laughs> you had to be mentally and physically and emotionally and spiritually ready to play that game, uh, because there were no bodies to play in addition to that. So you got you had to play, but you, do you feel fresh because of all the circumstances and how the dominoes fell for you? Um, yes, personally. Uh... Like, my whole life, I've always done, like, and no matter what season it was, I was always doing a sport. So, like, that was kind of, like, definitely with the COVID year was my first real year also going into, like, the year. Uh, I felt like I felt better, but I think, like, it, in the aspects of it hurt, uh, it hurt me with more of, like, the EDDs, like, the everyday drills, just the cutting all the time. And I think uh, that showed up majority of the year, definitely during camp. So, like, by the time I really got the hang of things again, like, my time was ready to shine, and I, I made the uh, best of my opportunity. It looks like you're running first team with Nickel uh, during the entire offseason here, and how does that suit your skill set, and how do you see this playing out for Thomas Graham Jr.? Um, I just feel like it's, it's, it's a high competition in that room just in general. Uh, you got Tay Young, uh, a vet, 
teaches me and helps me all the time. Like we we talk and, and pass a uh, little note so it's like a competitive edge and then we do the same thing. So I just feel like it's just going in there. Um, I wouldn't say anybody's a starter because we all got reps with the ones, but it's just all going in there. It's just like a high competition, I think. Um, like people talk about our secondary and, and things like that, but if, if you see the guys that we got, um, I think it's way better than what you what, what people say to realize. Um, and if you want to go look at the stats, go look at Duke's stats. 240 snaps start giving up a touchdown in the slot. And then Tay Young has, has already been proven to be one of the best nickel corners in, in the NFL already with his pedigree. So it's just like, I know his past, he's gotten hurt. So just stay in, stay healthy uh, for him and just kind of me just going out there being the young gun balling. So it's just like, you get three different players, but three great players, no matter what. Well, kind of piggybacking off that question a little bit. I remember you at the podium last year after your first start. And you said you're getting better. You're understanding the defense better. You're understanding your leverage a little better according to the defense call. So now when you get ready for this defense, are you a right or left cornerback? Or, I like Jeff said, the reps that you're taking at nickel. What What is the one, two, three process of Thomas Graham at this point in the upcoming season? Uh, with corner, it's kind of just kind of playing both sides. But right now it's probably going to be more nickel dominant. Um, and uh, I think uh, me personally, like, uh, I think this is a stepping stone on where I kind of want to go with my career. Um, eventually, I just want to be kind of just being able to follow somebody. Um, a person I, I really look up to is Darius Slay. Um, and I like watching his game because he he doesn't just play outside. He doesn't play inside. He just follows, like, the number one receiver. And that's kind of, like, where I want to do, have my end goal. But if I can't play in the slot, I've already showed I can play outside, like, if I can't consistently play in the slot, then I can't accomplish my goal. So it starts here. And I feel like playing in the slot, no matter what helps your game as a corner or a DB in general, just because like you going against little dudes that are like quicker and stuff like that. So it makes your film study more, more in detail, more in depth, because you feel me, you got to make sure that you're anticipating things, but you're not assuming. Cause if you assume you make, you feel me, you know, the, the, the rest of that one. So it's like, you got to be able to put yourself in those positions because you do have the Tariq Hills, the Jalen Waddles, and I can keep going on and on that just like, right. you feel me? You said you want to be on ESPN, the good way or the bad way. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, uh, we every player that Jeff and I have talked to since Matt Eberflus has been hired, we talked to about the comedy made about the running shoes. But, you know, corners... <laughs> Corners and wide receivers, they run all the time anyway. So it's not it's it's a big adjustment to us offensive linemen or defensive linemen in, in positions like that. Do you feel that you're running a lot or do you just have to be in shape so you can run a lot? Um, I feel like it's more like we are running a lot, but it's not like what he's asking us to run for, like is no reason. Like it's the what I talked about before was like the little things like we're not running like he's not making us run just to run like we're running majority of in all the times is to, to create good habits like for a team like if we want to be the defense that we say we want to do we have to always be able to swarm to the ball like you know like it was scary when you seen on film 11 dudes in the picture every time you watch this defense compared to seeing five or six dudes because you see five or six dudes you feel me running back, do the right thing, a receiver and get behind the coverage in this and spot. Like it may be a good, it's most likely going to be more exposed to play, but it's 11 guys to the ball. You know that like, it's always somebody coming and running there. Hey Thomas, in your football life, when's the last time that you've ran conditioning after practice? Uh, I will say my freshman year of college. All right. And I, I think that's part of the running process is he, they're asking you to run so fast in individual work, in the team works, in seven on seven, that you don't have to do conditioning after practice because you're, do, you're doing conditioning the entire practice. Exactly. And, and, and it, it just kind of like, it builds your workload too. And it, like we, we, you know, and you understand um, definitely from being a player, it's just like, we sometimes like be like, oh, this is a lot. But like when we go play that game and like it's the fourth quarter and you see that person yeah. across from you super tired and you just like, dang, this is just a normal Tuesday. Like it just it's it's a different feeling than that. It that builds confidence for, for you to do things that you didn't think you can do before. You know, Thomas Graham, our guest here on Bears All Access on Chicago Sports Radio 670, The Score. It's funny he asked you about that because when I first started covering sports, 
it was Tom's 85 team that won the Super Bowl, and I was at that training camp, and these guys, after practice, had to run sprints, and they were dying after double day. So he still has nightmares. That's why. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I like your routine more than the old yeah. routine. That's, the thing. That's why I asked that question. No question. Uh, so you mentioned Tavon Young. Now, what does this tell you about the business of the National Football League? Tavon Young was once the NFL's highest paid nickel and, and now not a part of the Baltimore Ravens anymore, finds a home here. Hopefully it's a, uh, an impactful one with the Bears, but you know, it's things change so quickly. Like you mentioned, Thomas, maybe some injuries here and there, but you know, once he's on top of the mountain, is this something you can learn from as a young player, just how important it all is? Yeah, it's just like um, it, it, he he'll tell you, um, and he's he's already talked to me about it. But it's just like kind of just like you got to just be able to enjoy each moment. Like you know, like football is a is a contact sport, so you're you're one serious injury away from not being able to play again. And also, like a lot of the stuff isn't avoidable, but you can do your best to work on things to avoid. So it's just like you got to like do little things and take care of your body. I think uh, the person that's done it best uh, to show us uh, professionally is LeBron James. Like you feel me? He invested so much money into his body early, even though like some people be like, why are you spending that much money on your body? And then look how it pays out for him. So it's just like, when you take care of your body, it repays it. So it's just like, that's one thing you got to do. And sometimes like with the sport that we play, some freak injuries some freak things happen, but it's just kind of more just like, putting yourself in a position to where a lot of those things don't happen. All right, we're just starting to get to know some of the new coaches. On the defensive side of the ball, uh, your DB coach, uh, James Rowe, and you have a nickel coach, David Overstreet. Coach Rowe indicated last month when we met with him that you meet with Coach Everstreet every morning at 7 a.m. What do you guys discuss? What's what's that been like? What's that relationship helping you? Um, It's helping me a lot. Um, It's it's something that it was a routine that I did in college with my DB coach and help me understand the defense process stuff, certain stuff. And then also just like kind of ask questions without being in the room with everybody else. Uh, and I think some, for some people it's bigger than others. Cause like, you know, sometimes some people, you know, you might get stage fight. You just feel like that might be a little bit too, but too much off topic. So I think it's been just like a great job of being able to, to kind of dissect the defense in, in other ways. And then, like, we don't just talk about the nickel or like, even like some days we won't even just come in and, and talk like, film on the defense we'll talk about just like my my everyday drills um he calls them edds and just little things and uh so playing and, and focusing on weaknesses i remember one of the first times we met uh, he went in there and put in uh showed me he put in three good plays three bad plays uh, of, of last year and it's just like those three bad plays we need to we need to fix that and those three good plays we need to keep and add and make those three six so it's just like it's a good thing and he's willing to to be honest with me and i think that's like one thing you need out of a coach. Every time you go to the line of scrimmage and you think of your train of thought, on this roster, you got receivers from 5'11", Darnell Mooney, to 6'5", EQ St. Brown. Do you have the same philosophical thinking once the ball is snapped, or do you have a different approach to that size difference? Oh, yeah, most definitely. You have a different approach, but I, I, it's, for me, it's not really too big on the size. It's like the style and type of receiver you are. Um, like, EQ has sneaky speed. Like, you feel me, Mooney, I put him in that same category, sneaky speed. Like, when I say that, it's just like, you run it with him, and it's just like, you right there, and then next thing you know, like, the ball in the air, and you look over, now they did one or two stripes ahead of you, but then you got, <laughs> like, you got somebody like Bayless that you already know has that, that speed on him. Um, and then... Let's see who you got. You got somebody like Pringle that's not as fast, but he's quicker. Like, so it's just like you kind of just like you got to know who, who you line up against. Um, right. No, no matter what. And I, I think it does a good job, like definitely like with the personnel difference with this year is because like we don't have all the same receivers. And and that's good because now it, it kind of teaches you how to when we actually start getting into the season, like just like in camp you weren't treating every receiver the same you can't treat every receiver you play against the same all right we'll let you go one final thought and we again appreciate your time uh thomas so what do we got uh nearly an all pack 12 secondary i mean that's what we're looking at here we got <laughs> kyler gordon washington jalen johnson utah you out of oregon you guys faced a lot of uh, air attacks for sure back in your college days but you know you mentioned maybe people don't think a lot about this secondary tom and i think it's one of the strengths of the team 
because there is a lot of depth and there's young talent and there's a, a veteran in there and Eddie Jackson, Tavon. I mean, there's depth. There's a lot of different ways you can go here uh, and all of you may be called upon. So, you know, is that what you're referring to? Because it, it is a very talented secondary that has to grow and, and have the chemistry, but it is talented. Um, yes, that's 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 really what it's, it's about. Like, I feel like there's really no drop off. Um, no, if you're going from the top to the bottom. So it's just like you get. I could I could speak on every single one of them. Um, and just to throw this out there though, you feel me? I do have a dub. I ended off with a win against Kyler and, and Jalen though in college. So <laughs> I'm a I'm a hold on to that one Let's go Ducks. But it feels real uh it feels real good when you have that because um like Pose um said earlier, he he's he's building a team based off of competition. Um and I feel like he's he's doing a great job. Um definitely in a room that that people talked about last year we gave him 31 passing touchdowns so it's just like um we got to do a, do our best to change that and the first thing he did was bring competition into the room and i think that's great like definitely for the team because at the end of the day we the only thing we can do is get better now exactly and that's a great thought to, to wind this up enjoy the uh, balance of your summer we'll see you back at training camp appreciate the time yes sir go bears thomas graham jr our guest here on bears all access Back with more with Jim Miller after this on Chicago Sports Radio 670 The Score. Get an up-close view of practice and your favorite Bears players at Hallis Hall. The 2022 training camp scheduled is out. Go to chicagobears.com for more details. Hope to see you guys at training camp. I know Jim's headed over to training camp this year. First couple of days when the fans are going to be there. And uh, it was a great environment during the pandemic period here. Now all those restrictions are lifted. Knock on wood, they stay that way. Fans are going to get a, a better view of things and interacting with their uh, favorite players. You know, I've, I've said this about all sports. For, for NFL training camps, it's a great up-close and, and personal view where the, the fans are so close. They're right there on the field. They're able to ask for autographs. And, and players want to put on a show. Well, like I said, they're, they want to entertain. And they want to show their best every single practice. And you get juice as a player when the, when the fans are there. So it's going to be great uh, for a family environment. Uh, for young, uh, you know, young kids to, to, to go and experience when an NFL training camp is, is about. And it's really just a, a great event uh, from that standpoint. And, you know, it's just good to have the fans back out. I know the players enjoy it, speaking from personal experience, and I'm glad they're, they're able to enjoy it this year. Uh, so a lot of fans are asking this, though, too, of me, and I'm sure they're doing it to you as well. You run into people. Uh, how, how's this team going to look? in 2022 and, and I Jim don't have an answer for you right now because it is a great unknown there's so many new moving parts and a new system that until we actually see it in week one against the 49ers we'll get a true flavor of what the intentions are we know what the plan is but what it ultimately looks like is another thing so I just go with okay fields commit explosive run game Mooney reaches another level Bayless Jones becomes an impact rookie. Offensive line comes together, becomes a strength. Defense flying around, forcing turnovers, having fun, scoring touchdowns. Travis Gibson becomes a double-digit sack guy. Roquan and All-Pro. Jalen Johnson becomes a lockdown guy, steps up in his third year. Eddie Jackson back to being dangerous. Eddie in the quick six Jackson, as I used to call him when he was putting the ball in the end zone. And, of course, the overriding stay healthy. That's a really big, big view of – but – is that all going to happen at once? Hard to say. But if it did, yeah, they could surprise a lot of folks. Yeah, I think you're looking for effort and competitive c- competitiveness from a very young team. You know, they're going to make their, their share of mistakes, but I think it's about incremental improvement. And how it starts, again, is not how it's going to finish. You know, you want to see that incremental growth uh, over the entire season. And there's going to be changes. You know, there's going to be guys in and out of the lineup that they're going to have to evaluate. They're going to learn from their mistakes. But I think if you see a, a team that's out there that's competitive, that puts forth that effort and is extremely tough, that's what Matt Eberflus has talked about, the standard. Can they meet that standard? Because if they don't meet that standard, there will be changes uh, throughout the in- entire season. So I think those are things that are going to be worth evaluating as the season goes along. But the the process, the growth of a young quarterback in Justin Fields, you mentioned the young players, whether it's Kyler Gordon in there, Jalen Johnson in a new style of uh, defense, Roquan Smith, evaluate these players and see where the growth is from the start of week one to where it finishes in week 17. And beyond this year, Pro Football Focus a couple weeks ago did a 
whole analysis of the salary cap. The Bears have the most effective cap space in the NFL over the next three years. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, next year the Bears are going to have over $120 million to spend in free agency. So there's teams like Atlanta, uh, the Chicago Bears. I think Atlanta is really the comparable for the Bears, right? They're going to go in a different direction at quarterback. They've changed, moved away from Matt Ryan, who's now an Indianapolis Colt, and they're playing a lot of young players. Last year was their foundational year. But look at that team. They were 7-9. and nine. You know, they were a competitive uh, team that was right there in the mix that had an opportunity uh, to make the playoffs uh, a season ago. So I think it, that's how Bears fans need to look at it. You know, I, I think we're, we're looking at delusions of grandeur if we say, hey, this team's going to the Super Bowl. But can you be a competitive team and lay that foundation? Because much like Atlanta, the Bears will be in a similar spot where they're able to have $120 million and really go out and sign some impactful free agents next year. But this is a foundational year where they'll have the opportunity to do that. All right, a couple quick hitters uh, on, a, on a broader scope and in a, an, an interesting question for you to answer as well. All right, we're going to talk quarterback. So uh, Deshaun Watson reportedly going to have his hearing tomorrow at the National Football League. What might happen there? What happens mm-hmm. at Baker Mayfield? And Jimmy Garoppolo, uh, off-season shoulder surgery, beginning to throw soon, which could then start p- potential discussions of trades. Where do you see these three things going? Guys like Ben Roethlisberger, he got six games. He wasn't convicted of anything either, but minimum he got six games. I think it's going to be more than that for Deshaun Watson. I think everybody's bracing for a year uh, suspension is, is what it's, what it's going to be uh, for Deshaun. And I still go back to this. Cleveland, they have the rights to Baker Mayfield. And if I'm Baker Mayfield, I'm just putting myself in his shoes The best opportunity is with the Cleveland Browns. He knows this offense. They own his rights. They don't have to trade him anywhere. There's been teams that that think that they're just going to release him. Why why would the Browns do that? They're they're on the hook for $18.8 million regardless. All right? So Carolina has consistently tried to work a trade uh, for Baker Mayfield. They want uh, Cleveland to pick up more than half of his contract, and that may be the point where he could be moved if, say, you know, Cleveland's willing to pay $9 million of the $18 million. But I don't think it's going there. You know, to me, for Cleveland, Baker Mayfield's the best option. I think he's the upgrade to, uh, to uh, Jacoby Brissett, who's the backup right now. But for Baker, he should want to go in there and play, not accrue the, the fines and suspensions, because they could fine him for conduct detrimental if he decides not to show up uh, for training camp. Plus, it would put him in the best position – to get traded to another team by the trade deadline. Okay, if he's out there and he plays and plays well, potentially he could be a chip that could be moved. So there's still a lot that that needs to to unfold. And the minimum, what needs to unfold first, is what is going to be the punishment for Deshaun Watson. Because I think that is really going to dictate where it goes uh, for Baker Mayfield this, off, this, uh, this season. How about Jimmy G quickly? Uh, Jimmy G, I do expect him to be a, a trade chip, but if I'm San Francisco, I again, I own his rights. We don't know about Trey Lance. I mean, think of Trey Lance from North Dakota State. We have not even seen him in a two-minute offensive situation. Can this guy lead a team, you know, in a two-minute where it's strictly on his arm? He got his feet wet last year. He's one and one as a starter. There's a lot of growth that needs to happen there. So Jimmy G still could be the best option if, say, Trey Lance falls on his face the first four weeks of the season. They may want to put Jimmy G back in the in the lineup once he's healthy. So I think, again, I think San Francisco is going to slow play it. Let him get healthy. Trey Lance is the quarterback. If he falls on his face, they've already got a guy on the bench that has led that team to the Super Bowl in an NFC championship game a year ago. All right, I had a real special question for you, just, you know, as it relates to you, but I'm going to have to wait till next week. We're out of time. So All right. I will not forget it. I won't, can't wait to hear your answer. Jim, thanks very much. Enjoy the rest of your time in Mobile. All right, will do, Jeff. Always good to be with you. Thanks for listening, everybody. That's going to do it for Jim Metter. I'm Jeff Joniak. Thanks again to Bears cornerback Thomas Graham, our producers tonight, including Jordan Treadup. And thanks of all to you for listening. This has been Bears All Access on Chicago Sports Radio 670 The Score. Good night, everybody.